Good morning everyone. I hope everyone's having a great Saturday. So I decided that I wanted to look at the Shadowlands patch 9.2 and kind of give some initial thoughts on the developers preview and some of the content that's out already. Um, I played World of Warcraft from the beginning um, when it first came out. I did so through the vanilla and the better part of the Burning Crusades expansion as a casual type player. Um, I didn't raid. I pretty much spent most of the time with my PvP flag up and killing people and farming and stuff like that. Some of my favorite stuff to do in that game was the world PvP and being able to just go out and farm things, go craft things, you know, put them up on the auction house, be able to make gold. Much like I do in Final Fantasy XIV, um, I, I love the crafting system in that game. It just—it's. I don't think anyone's made one yet that compares to it. But anyways, back to the topic at hand. Um, about right before the start of Patch Nine Point One in Shadowlands, I just couldn't continue on anymore. Um, the game had become almost like a part-time job after I got done working and being a business architect you put in a lot of hours the last thing you want to do when you when you're going to a place to escape is feel obligated to do chores before you can actually enjoy any of the games so for me um, that was that was really the the tipping point and I haven't subscribed back since um, I didn't subscribe for 9.15 I don't really have any plans to I don't want to even though they made it easier I don't want to go back to a game where I feel obligated I want to be able to go into a game play it do what I want to do I want to go raid you know I want to I want to go and farm I want to go and explore the world and have that world be meaningful and to me it's felt like you know that hasn't been the way of things for a while and I guess this this year is when I finally just came to the realization that the game I used to love is not the game I'm playing anymore so um, I've been playing other games New World periodically and primarily Final Fantasy 14 so let's look at this and we'll see what kind of reaction this gets this, this world looks beautiful so looking at that um, tier sets that's something that they should have never gotten rid of in my opinion uh, concept art so let's see that looks really cool some screenshots and some wallpapers alright so let's jump into the video here and let's see what we find out. The Shadowlands story pulls together threads that started in Warcraft 3 and wove their way through many of our expansions. We approached it like a drama in three acts. Now, as the third and final act begins of the saga, we need to stop the Jailer from reaching his ultimate goal, which is to rewrite the rules of reality Eternity's End serves as the final chapter of one book of the Warcraft saga. The Jailer has the advantage. He has seized the sigils of the leaders of the Four Covenants. We see Sylvanas realize that she's been a pawn in the Jailer's game this entire time, and she refuses to serve him, and she's taken prisoner. The Jailer is able to open a portal to who knows where, taking Anduin with him. And the Primus had us take some time to retrieve some new sigils. Now we have gathered our forces. We are working with the Primus to open our own gateway to pursue the Jailer to this realm unlike any we've seen before. Luzareth Mortis. The Primus opens a portal and we come into this alien land. It's completely white, foggy, we're walking on water for some reason. They can only make out some shapes, some figures there, some crazy devices and consoles. Eventually you make That's your way really to a beautiful. giant gate, and behind it lies Zareth Mortis. 
Zerith Mortis was this kind of looks a little bit like and it is Bastion in a way, but think of it as being tucked away in the fabric of the Shadowlands itself. It's kind of the behind the scenes of these afterlives that we've journeyed to. It's the land where the progenitors, the first ones who created all of the realms of the Shadowlands, this is their workshop. They've created everything we've experienced in Azeroth and Shadowlands and even realms we haven't discovered yet. These first ones built the universe as far as we know, but their intentions or methods are completely unknown. But of course the... So wait, are we supposed to like the first ones or are we supposed to hate them? Because are they the ones that built world the like the entire land and just those things or are they the ones that we're supposed to blame for all of the bad decisions like borrowed power that were created throughout the different expansions jailer's presence here is disrupting this process and we're working to push back against the jailer's forces and protect this place makes sense i think the artists have done a fantastic job and i know they did a lot of research I'd agree. So far, this looks really amazing, even though, like, you know, you can definitely see that there's some some tones of, like, Bastion and and such in it, but it's presented in a way that makes it entirely new, and it's, you know, if you think about it from a lore perspective, if they've created this land, it makes sense that they would have taken some of the land that they, cre the ideas that for the land that they created, and they would have dispersed that across Azeroth and Shadowlands and the other things that they were doing. Makes sense. And they looked at a lot of real life examples of very strange places in the real world. As a team, we were really trying to make this place as alien as possible. So we really wanted to make everything feel completely unique and completely different. Our trees here are floating. We have stones that are floating. We even have the massive Forge of Afterlives that is floating in the center of the zone. And true to its name, it's something that is kind of putting together a new afterlife to be sent out into the Shadowlands. We have this water all around you because water is really the catalyst for any kind of creation. It's actually unlike any other water that we've seen before. This is actually water that we can walk on. It almost creates like a threshold between Serith Mortis and some other kind of more primordial space right hmm. below it. Everything you see in Serith Mortis has a, a purpose, an intention behind it. For us, it was really important to find ways to convey that intention. See, so that's really important when you're making a any kind of game you're making the zones I mean it's easy to spin up an area like this but when you actually put the thought into it that you know each piece of each piece of this has a reason for being there you know why is it there and you give it a purpose I think that makes it a bit more meaningful when you're creating something in the environment itself and one of the ways in which we did it was through this duality between a lush and a dry biome in the dry biome, we see perhaps kind of like what the original look of the zone was when the progenitors were first establishing this workspace for themselves. And with in the little lush AQ biome, we see the result it. of their experimentation with plant life and fauna and things like that. These are all test beds for what we'll eventually see elsewhere. From there, we started thinking about what kinds of creatures would be in this place that are fundamentally uh, prototypes. There's terraforming here. There's creatures that are building afterlives. We tried to really stretch and think what that might be like. My personal favorite includes the giant armored snail, and we also have a progenitor chicken, which answers the question of what came first. Ah, I see what you did there. These first ones who crafted Zareth Mortis, what they left behind were the Automa, meant to take care of the place and make sure that it fulfilled its function to create afterlives. The Automa have several different classes, and you can see this in their silhouettes. We have the Builders, we have the Protectors, we have the Casters, and each one of them have a specific role within the Shadowlands. And then you'll also discover the Jiro, which are a part of the Automa. They're a little Ooh, more quirky, cool. they have a little more personality, they are a little more sentient than the other Automa, so some of them even split off to pursue their own desires. Unfortunately, <laughs> when we found our way in, Devourers also found their way in. They are ravenous. They're consuming this weird energy, and it's causing them to mutate and to fall apart. And the automa, well, they fall they apart, you don't have to kill them. them. Some of them are fighting them off. And so it's going to take some time for them to understand that we're here trying to help them drive out this threat. The enlightened. Fortunately, we've got some allies. There are some enlightened brokers here that we're going to be working with. But it's a broker that arrived here quite a long time ago, and 
has had a change of heart from looking at the world as a very transactional place to seeing this place as a holy place, a sacred place. We meet an enlightened one named Fareem, and Fareem needs our assistance, and in return, he leads us to Haven, which is a hub that has been created out of progenitor ruins, and this is where the enlightened really have made their home. Haven serves as our foothold here, as well as use it as a base of operations and really start unlocking the mysteries of this land. The Enlightened Brokers are intent on protecting and preserving the work of the First Ones here, but now they're seeing Zoval bring his forces against the Atoma and tear up the land, and they are eager for assistance. The Brokers themselves are very ostentatious, they're very into materialism, but the Enlightened are not that at all. They have relinquished this material way, and you'll see this reflected in their clothes. They're a little tattered, they're a little faded, because it just isn't important to them anymore. They're just here for the pursuit of knowledge. Hmm. Safer are the first ones. When players arrive, they're kind of fishes out of water. And one of the first things that we have to do is start learning how to communicate with the Automa. Think of it as a kind of runic language based in symbols. We will bond with a small construct. It was pretty cute, actually. And with his assistance oh, and yeah. the assistance of Farim, uh, we will learn eventually how to understand the symbols through the cipher of the first ones. We'll uncover different parts of this alphabet and start to learn more about the progenitors and Xerath Mortis itself. It will allow you to unlock new and different forms of content. So that can range from daily quests to new options on the vendors to places to explore and new side quests that open up so it's really see i really like this so you know you like go into a place you've never been before the expectation is that things should feel new you shouldn't be able to walk in and be completely proficient in the language understand everything that's going on and be able to do it if you have to actually go out and you have to explore you know almost like from an archaeological standpoint you have to go out and you have to learn about this area learn about the people in it and as you start learning you start understanding a bit more and you know naturally that would open up conversations that would open up other things so i think that this is a really good move i think I think it's pretty brilliant. Really the gateway to exploring the far reaches of Xerath Mortis. As we looked into the development of Cypher of the First Ones, we wanted something that was unique that players haven't seen before. A little bit the of familiarity, but something that takes that to the next level. We really involved the whole team in this creative process. We worked with our UI team to be able to represent those through text, through these things talking and seeing them on screen in chat bubbles and, and in our chat window. Little by little, these kind of runes start taking shape into words that we recognize, but it's gonna be a process that unfolds over the course of playing through Eternity's End. The Automa speak in this kind of musical language. They don't talk the way that we mortals are used to speaking. The sound team was super excited. They jumped in, uh, they started prototyping all kinds of different sounds. We listened, we gave feedback. That's pretty cool. And we really ended up in a cool place. As you're playing through and gradually unlocking the language, you'll be able to see those words. It kind of like gives you the, it kind of adds to the feeling of the zone. It's like, you know, it's not like anything you've ever been to before. It's not, it's not like, you know, killing the same kind of bear and the bear makes the same sound in 20 different places or, you know, these things are actually unique. They're not reskinning the sounds. They're actually bringing new, new sound to the creatures and things like that too. It's that they're saying, but still hear those tones. Sepulcher of the first ones. The jailer's true goal has never really been to escape the maw or to gain power. He's been focused on reaching this place called the sepulcher, to go into this place of power and to really rewrite the rules of the universe. We'll learn that the jailer has breached the sepulcher of the first ones, and this becomes our new raid for eternity's end. We're gonna gather our forces, we're gonna pursue the jailer inside. Once you go inside the sepulcher, there are some mind-blowing visuals. This is a place that Ooh. should not be able to exist according to the laws of physics as we know them on Azeroth. Just looking at... So it's like totally like a Final Fantasy XIV-esque type 
experience, but it's different than the you know the historic World of Warcraft raids. They're doing something a bit different. They're going into like a more techy sci-fi type look right there out into this impossible sky of seeing these ancient works of the first ones those laws don't apply to anything we see here among the bosses that we're going to face in sepulchre of the first ones include the jailer's forces maybe a dreadlord or two that you haven't tied up loose ends with uh, we'll face a consular this is similar to a being like algalon but the jailer's gotten to it and has infused his domination magic into mm, the consular. that's interesting before we get to the jailer however so we they're need already to get to kick some first. ass our hope is that we can learn whatever Anduin knows about domination magic. We need to be able to resist it, or better yet, fight it. Tear sets. We know players have been waiting a long time for the return of tear sets, and as devs, we have too. It's a great blend of progenitor You could have brought magic, it back anytime you wanted to. Metals, along with those class-defining silhouettes. Wolves for shamans, pointy things for rogues. It's going to look amazing. Our class and combat team was super excited to bring class sets back. This is something that felt really right for the story. We're in the final act of the Shadowlands saga. We're here literally on the brink at eternity's end. Pretty cool. And what better place to fully unleash the power of these classes? And I think players will really enjoy the return of those class sets just as much as the team enjoyed making them. How do you make something that is mystical and magical and incomprehensible and yet understandable? I think we've done a good job of finding that line. The team as a whole has been working so hard and we are so excited to get this out for everyone. We're gonna get new mounts, new pets. A bit horrifying for me, but exciting for some is the fact that, you know, some of the spider mounts can now uh. fly. Who needs flying spiders? But that's also gonna be a cool thing for people. We have updates to professions, to soul binds, to conduits. There's Hopefully good updates to professions. Fair. I'm story guy, so I'm super geeked about watching players the mini kind game of is piece pretty together cool. those little lore tidbits. That's what excites me as well. I'm really looking forward to season three of Mythic Plus. Tazavesh is getting split into two dungeons. If you're a raider, I knew that if was you coming. Keystone Master, if you're an achievement collector, there's something for everyone to do in this. Shadowlands is like the final chapter of one book of the Warcraft saga. And our team is already hard at work on the next stories to come. Can't talk about them quite yet. But when the time is right, we're going to be really excited to share them with you. Cross-faction gameplay. Alright, so overall that was pretty impressive. I mean, it looks like they're trying to go a different route towards the tail end of Shadowlands, um, wrapping up the story. The story itself... I, you could have easily did a patch 9.3 and spread that out and put a lot more backstory into it. I mean, pretty much go from trying to kill the Jailer but have absolutely no idea why the Jailer is, needs to be killed. You, you don't have much backstory. Like, is he really a bad guy or a good guy? We don't know. Um... It could be a lot more story too. You know, they could have added more bits with the Tyrande and Sylvanas thing. There are a billion different directions they could have went to split this out. It seems like they may have kind of compacted to get through Shadowlands and get to the next expansion. Not to mention the fact that the patch cycle is way off. Um, they've been in patch 9.1 for a long time, and you know this is going to hit the PTR in a couple of weeks, which means. You know, you're already in November, the holidays are coming up. You're not going to see a patch 9.2 probably for another three or four months at at the earliest. Which means by now everyone's in a content drought. I'm not because I haven't been playing. I still have all of the 9.1 content. Um, I opened up Corthy and I think that was about the extent of it. Alright, so let's go back here and see what else there is. Seventeenth anniversary. So let's look at the raid. The raid has eleven bosses and with Anduin being the eighth boss. The first week of the new raid will take us up to Anduin, allowing us to take a closer look at his story. He'll be a very, very complex boss. The first three bosses will be available on normal, heroic, and mythic difficulty during the third week of the raid. So the first two week or the first 
couple weeks of the raid, you're not going to be able to do the 9th, 10th, and 11th boss. Which is going to be gated because of the story, but let's be realistic, it's not going to matter really, is it? I mean, the world first race is still going to only take a week and a half, two weeks tops. Because you're going to take everyone, you're going to put them in the PTR, you're going to let them do all 11 of these bosses, you're going to let them test these bosses, you're going to let them complete all of these bosses, they're going to do them all. Someone is going to be making weak orders, someone's going to be making deadly boss mods, someone's going to be making big wigs mods. And they're going to go into the first week when they can go into these raids fully prepared to do the encounters. So you know, the week for the story is nice, but it doesn't have any impact on the world first race. Mythic is going to open with all of the bosses because Mythic is going to open the third week of the patch. The first week of the patch, there won't be a raid. The second week, there'll be normal heroic for the eight bosses so you've only you've only procrastinated when the world first race is going to start you've not procrastinated how long it's going to take them to complete this raid and once they complete this raid that's their content for however long it takes you to go from 9.2 to the new patch so i mean If you want to make if you want to make this content last longer, you have to make people actually go in and figure out how to do it when the content comes out, not when you've been testing the content. Uh, Zareth Mortis will be very large. That's good because it'll give you this this right here. This content right here needs to gate over a period of time that will allow players to have reusable content until the expansion. Otherwise. The people that do come back for 9.2 are going to get through this. They're going to get through the raid. And then they're going to be done until your expansion. And then, of course, they snuck in the level 60 character boost. I mean, realistically, you know, why not? You're going to have people going into this patch... You know, getting ready to go into this patch, and this patch and 9.15 are going to carry probably until, you know, maybe the end of next year before you have a new World of Warcraft expansion to play. So, yeah. Those are my reactions. Um, you know, will I go back for 9.2? I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, Endwalker release for Final Fantasy 14 is imminent and I've really been enjoying playing that game the contents re you know your old content is reusable you can go back there's purpose you know there's a lot of reasons why I stopped playing World of Warcraft and started playing Final Fantasy 14 so uh, we will see all right thanks everyone for watching